Good evening and a warm welcome to all of you who have gathered here this evening for our Zoonet monthly talk. Uh, this evening we will be discussing about humans and Asian elephants and the conflict situation that has arisen between these two groups, addressing both the causes and the solutions. And it is both my honor and privilege to introduce to you our speaker for this evening, uh, Ms. Surendrani Cabral Dimel. PhD candidate at the University of Southern Queensland. Her research interests lie in behavioral ecology and human dimensions of wildlife conservation. And she has conducted research on human attitudes towards mitigating human wildlife conflict, particularly with monkeys and elephants in Sri Lanka. She obtained her BSc honors in zoology from the University of Colombo and master of research degree in wildlife conservation from the University of Southampton, UK. She is currently a PhD candidate at University of Southern Queensland. We look forward to hear you speak this evening. Over to you, Madam. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen first. So can you see my screen now? Is it on full screen? Yes. And you can hear me well, right? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. So hello, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me for your monthly webinar today. And I'd like to thank Dr. Chanta Jaising for inviting me. Uh, first, to introduce myself, my name is Surendrani Kabral, and I'm currently a PhD candidate at University of Southern Queensland. My current research involves, uh, in, my PhD research actually involves testing a new uh, tool to manage elephant movement and mitigate human elephant conflict, for which I use captive elephants, but which I will talk to you later during the presentation. But part of my presentation, also, my uh, research also involved uh, studying people's attitudes towards causes and solutions to conflicts between humans and Asian elephants. So human elephant conflict is a daily topic in Sri Lanka for us uh, Sri Lankans because we hear of an elephant death almost every day. And many people are suffering from encounters between in with elephants and people also retaliate against elephants trying to save their lives and livelihoods. So during my presentation, I will first briefly talk to you about Asian elephants and uh, threats to their conservation. Then we'll dwell more on the human elephant conflict situation and the currently practiced and available human elephant conflict mitigation methods. And then we'll talk about hum people's attitudes towards these, the causes and solutions to human elephant conflict. And finally, I'd like to introduce to you what I did for my, as part of my research, the new tool that I tested uh, as a potential tool to manage elephant movement in the future. So let's start. So Asian elephants uh, are the largest living land animal in Asia. They are mega herbivores. They uh, travel long distances in search of their needs. They spend about 12 to 18 hours consuming about 150 kilograms of food a day. And they play a very, so they play a very important role in the ecosystem as they move and forage in the land. They break, they make considerable changes to the uh, habitat where they let light fall onto ground and then they help in seed, seed dispersal. And protecting elephants, of course, also helps protect all the other animals in that particular habitat. So the basic social unit of elephants are matriarchal groups of about five to 20 individuals, and uh, which comprises of uh, closely related adult females with their offsprings. And, uh, uh, and it is led by an, uh, the oldest female. Males, uh, as they reach adulthood, they leave these herds and they uh, live solitary lives or in small and temporary male groups. So Asian elephants are found in 13 Asian countries and currently there are three subspecies recognized. Uh, the Indian elephant in the Asian mainland, 
the Sumatran elephant in the island of Sumatra of Indonesia, and the Sri Lankan elephant in Sri Lanka. Why I say three, currently uh, that three subspecies are recognized currently is because the Borneo elephant in the Bo, uh, the island of Borneo, is currently re it's it's recognized as a evolutionary significant unit based on the genetic studies, and it is currently under assessment and may be reinstated as a fourth as the fourth subspecies as Elephas maximus borneensis in the future. So this is still under assessment and it might be uh, c c recognized as a fourth subspecies in the future. So the total uh, wild elephant population, elephant population is estimated around 50,000 individuals and 75% uh, of, uh, of this is found in India and Sri Lanka. And Sri Lanka has the second highest elephant pop uh, wild Asian population, second only to India. And uh, the, we, we have the highest density of, uh, as a country, we hold the highest density of Asian elephants. Uh, so Asian elephants are listed as endangered in the IUCN red list of threatened species. And uh, also in Appendix 1 of the of CITES, the Convention for International Trade of Endangered Species since 1975, prohibiting the international trade of elephants and their body parts. So Asian elephants have played a very important role in Asian culture, heritage, and as a relig religious icon since ancient times. So elephant is worshipped as a god in Hinduism and plays a very important role in Buddhism, two of the main religions in this region. And uh, Asian elephant was first tamed about 4,000 years ago and ancient kings maintained thousands of elephants as uh, warriors and work elephants uh, and traded and gifted them between countries. And today elephants are commonly used in ceremonial and religious rituals and in tourism industry and also in the logging industry but it is, it is not uh, common these days because logging has been banned uh, by most countries so there is a captivation population of about 16000 individuals in range countries and another 1000 uh, about 1000 maintained in zoos outside range countries so there are various threats faced by Asian elephants for their conservation. And uh, so they have been poached for ivory, meat, hair, tail, bones, and skin. So this top picture on the right-hand side, I've taken it from uh, Dr. Christy Sampson's study uh, in 2008, published in 2018, done in Myanmar. So this is quite an issue being poached for all uh, various body parts in Southeast Asian countries. And uh, the elephants are also being uh, captured illegally for domestication and illicit trade. So I would like, uh, if you're interested, this bottom picture was taken from Sukhul Lahir Prakash's study in 2020, which was done uh, uh, based on the issue that was uh, quite uh, widely discussed a few years ago uh, in Sri Lanka. So this, you can read more, uh, read that article for more information if you like. But for Asian elephants, probably the biggest problem uh, is uh, habitat loss and fragmentation because all Asian elephant range countries have high, very high human population densities and developing economies, and they are focusing on large scale and uh, rapid development projects, converting wilderness areas to permanent human settlements, commercial zones and agricultural lands which disrupts landscape connectivity and obstructs traditional travel routes. And this results in a very heterogeneous and fragmented landscapes, increasing the interactions, frequency of interactions between humans and elephants. So this inevitably leads to human-elephant conflict. So in India, about 400 humans and about 100 elephant deaths are recorded each year. And Sri Lanka, we record the second highest number of human deaths and the highest number of elephant deaths. And now we are we have exceeded 400 elephant deaths a year, and majority of which are results from human actions. So then, large scale economic and uh, economic losses are being faced by farmers due to crop and property damage caused by elephants. 
And although unaccounted for, there's a lot of indirect social and psychological effects resulting from injury, loss of livelihoods, or loss of a family member. So then moving on uh, to deaths and injury to elephants, these may be caused by both unintentional and intentional actions by humans. So unintentional actions uh, may be uh, uh, caused by deaths may be caused by accidents from electrocutions electrocution from lethal electric fences connected to the main power grid falling into agricultural or uh, gem pits colliding with trains or getting caught in traps and snares set for other animals and then intentional deaths may be caused by apart from being poached for uh, body parts people often retaliate against problem causing elephants so they try to kill elephants by shooting, poisoning, and using jaw bombs or hakapadas. I assume you, uh, so hakapadas is actually a fruit or a vegetable filled with, uh, uh, stuck with uh, explosives. When the elephant bites into it, it explodes in their mouth, like causing serious injury to them. So then death and injury to humans may be caused during chance encounters, especially when confronting elephants at night, to, trying to chase them away or when they enter forest to extract resources, or irresponsible behavior like drunkenness. And uh, though we don't record this in, uh, this in Sri Lanka, in India, it's recorded that uh, fatal encounters may happen with elephants when people uh, set out at dawn for toileting. So these are also, uh, this could cause in death and injury to humans. So, I'd like to now focus on the human elephant country mitigation approaches. There are various approaches being used, and here I'd like to categorize it uh, to five categories based on a review that I conducted recently. And uh, so the most common approach is for us to exclude elephants from human areas by using physical barriers or like electric fences or non-electric fences like trenches, rubber walls, ditches, and uh, can so the main problem is that these physical barriers have inherent issues like they lack flexibility once they are built and they re restrict access to resources for both elephants and other animals and it's a matter of time that elephants learn to break most of these fences electric fences and then trenches could get filled up due to erosion elephants kicking in the sides and also they could get filled up uh, during rainy season with water and uh, they're also because of that they're expensive to build and maintain but the biggest problem with the uh, let's say electric fences in sri lanka is that they're we have so much electric so many electric fences built but uh, at the wrong place most if they we have built electric fences mainly around protected areas and sometimes even between uh, this picture was actually taken from the national action plan uh, 2000 in, uh, submitted in 2020. So we have uh, electric fences built between the, uh, the wildlife conservation department and forest department uh, protected areas. And elephants are found on both and uh, on either sides and even on the sides where people live. So what should actually happen is that there should be exclusion fences. They should be uh, built uh, on uh, uh, on the side of, I mean, uh, exclude, excluding elephants from the developed area. So electric fences can be the most effective method if properly built, if pro built at the right place uh, and maintained. So community-based electric fences are now being uh, promoted by uh, Dr. Priti Rajvananda and, and his team in uh, where they uh, they suggest that uh, they have already tried this and have shown that it's successful that building permanent electric fences around villages and temporary electric fences around uh, agricultural lands so that they can be removed after harvesting and be allowed and those lands can be allowed for elephants to be used are quite successful. And this, there was a recent short communication by, uh, uh, by a group uh, led by Prof. Dangola uh, which also talks about the same type of electric fences, private electric fences, that they are quite successful, especially because the responsibility of maintenance and constructing them lies with the community. So this, this electric fences, if they are community managed, they can be quite effective in managing human elephant conflict. 
So moving on to other approaches. So biofences uh, are like other ex exclusionary methods are uh, biofences where you can plant thorny plants like cactus or agave or planting non-preferred crops like chili and citrus and beehive fences. But there are uh, shortcomings in these as well. So elephants are thick-skinned animals. They can easily, if these uh, pl thorny plants are not properly planted, they could push those them aside and walk through them uh, easily. And then uh, non-preferred crops can obviously create uh, alternative income options for people. But it has also been found that certain non-preferred crops like chili and citrus are sometimes being con consumed by uh, elephants. So it sometimes becomes unsuccessful. And then beehive fences. Although it has been very successful in Af African countries, in Asia it has not been so. So it has been tested in uh, several Asian countries and in the long term it has not been successful. Uh, one of the reasons may be that Asian uh, honeybee is not as aggressive uh, as the African honeybee. So the Asian elephants are not so scared of the Af the Asian honeybee. And uh, because it, the bees are active during daytime and the elephants raid crops during nighttime. So some, some of these things may be causing this to be un unsuccessful in the long term, but it may be something that can be further investigated. So then people often use sensory deterrents like smoke, chili bombs, bonfires, uh, torching, uh, lighting lamps and uh, flashlights, then loud sounds like firecrackers and thunder flashes. Uh, these can be effective in the short term, but in the long term, the problem is that elephants are very intelligent and they get used to this, they habituate to this. So in the long term, it becomes uh, ineffective. But if they are used alternatively, there may be a chance that uh, this, so rather than using the same method continuously, using them alternately, alternatively might work. Then we have elephant drives. So elephant drives may be, uh, is where you push elephants into uh, protected areas using people, vehicles, and in some countries using captive elephants and aircrafts as well. So they can be large scale elephant drives where you try to push away a large uh, herds of uh, herds of, into protected areas or sometimes just a few elephants or one or two elephants. But the problem with large scale uh, elephant drives especially is that they are costly, time consuming. It requires a lot of human resources and there's a risk for the people involved in it. And then concentrating a large number of elephants uh, in protected in certain small areas already, which has reached carrying capacity, results in, uh, with, so with limited resources, they end up dying from starvation. This has been reported. And most of the time, these elephants will escape these places and continue the human elephant conflict cycle. And it has also been reported that it caused severe stress to animals that are being uh, driven like this. Then uh, removing problem elephants is also uh, an approach that we could take. But so sometimes it used to be elephants, problem elephants used to be killed but this is not done uh, or encouraged anymore due to ethical reasons. But translocation, of course, is happening, is a point, uh, popular method. People always ask for a problem elephant to be pressurized the government to uh, translocate a problem elephant. But uh, so translocation can happen either to a protected area away from their capture site, to a wild elephant holding ground like what we have in, at Horopatana, or in some countries, problem elephants can be captured and tamed. So when it comes to uh, capture and taming a wild adult uh, elephant, uh, that is quite a difficult thing. It could result in trauma for the elephant and even subsequent death for the animal. So, but when, uh, with regard to translocation, it is quite an expensive uh, strategy and the uh, elephants do not stay in the area they are, where they are released. They often try to return home 
or disperse and create more conflict. So it simply uh, shifts the problem from one place to another. And when it comes to the elephant holding grounds, they're expensive to build and maintain. They have limited capacity. So if they're not properly maintained and supplemented, that it has been recorded that some elephants have died of starvation. And elephants have also been reported to leave uh, elephant holding grounds and try to return home or disperse and cause conflict as usual. So there was this uh, publication, a report published by uh, the National Audit Office and uh, uh, where they e evaluated the performance of the Horopatana elephant holding ground. So uh, this is an excerpt from that book where they say, according to the report of the elephant census conducted in June 9, 2019, out of 52 elephants retained in the holding ground, only nine elephants were remaining and 12 elephants had died on various reasons. So the department lacked information as to whether the remaining 31 elephants had either died or fled. The holding ground. So basically, uh, this this method is a failed approach if we do not properly monitor and maintain these uh, different holding grounds. So then we have early warning systems. It could be traditional or modern uh, methods. So traditional early warning systems is uh, where farmers set up watchtowers and spend all night uh, looking out for elephants and send warning uh, mess, uh, and uh, uh, send messages to their uh, neighbors when an elephant or a herd is approaching. But the problem with this is that this is lab intensive and uh, lack of sleep at night could cause health and uh, affect the social well-being of farmers. But then we have modern remote sensing methods that are being tried and uh, some are, are even being implemented in some countries. So GPS callers, and in, uh, then infrasonic call detectors that can detect the low frequency rumbles of elephants and then uh, geophones which can uh, detect the vibrations when elephants walk uh, move and some countries even use drones and infrared triggered cameras to detect elephants from far and then send messages to mobile phones of villagers informing them about uh, the presence of an elephant to take action to chase them away. But the problem with these early warning systems is that unless they are coupled with an aversive uh, stimulus to be automatically emitted, people will have to take a manual approach to, as usual, to chase the elephants away. But this can certainly prevent, uh, warn people and uh, prevent incidents from occurring, occurring beforehand. Then we have human-centric approaches we can, which can help people uh, to develop tolerance in people by providing financial relief through compensation schemes or maybe with uh, insurance schemes. But the problem with that is that it doesn't prevent the problem. It just provides immediate relief and assessments are subjective uh, and difficult and people could claim, I mean, for, like fraudulent claims. And then reporting can be tedious and most of the time people are uh, People don't report because of these issues. And then creating awareness and capacity building are also very important to improve people's uh, tolerance and attitudes. But it has we have to make sure that uh, that you monitor the progress of it to ensure that people have actually changed their attitudes and behaviors and practices. Uh, because it can the, what is the, the information provided can often be ignored or misinterpreted. So then finally, the habitat management is one of the most important things uh, that we should do, improving connectivity between habitats and habitat quality within protected areas. This can reduce the chances of elephants venturing out into uh, human-dominated habitats. So, but what you can see is that most of the methods that we are using, are we are trying to exclude or remove elephants from human dominated areas. But a study, island-wide study conducted by Dr. Prithviraj Fernando and his team has shown that uh, elephants occur over 60% of uh, Sri Lanka and people uh, reside in 70% of their range. So coexistence is the only way forward. But for people affected by human elephant conflict to, uh, fe uh, to, feel, to be willing to coexist, it is important that they feel safe, their lives and livelihoods are safe by uh, 
implementing proper human infant conflict strategies so that they feel the benefit and the importance of sharing the land with uh, elephants. But so we need their support, the support of all stakeholders to successfully implement uh, human infant conflict management plans. But lack of agreement between different stakeholders could create difficulties in effectively implementing them. We often take into account expert opinions when uh, planning human elephant conflict uh, or any wildlife management strategy. But we need to find out if the expert opinion is the same as the other stakeholders. And if there are conflicting opinions, there may be uh, things that we need to give special attention when planning and implementing uh, wildlife management programs. So I conducted a social survey uh, to find out the these about to assess these opinions, so I conducted an online survey which targeted citizens of all Asian different countries. Although most of my participants were uh, Sri Lankans, and then it was also uh, it was targeted experts working on Asian infants from all over the world. And then the paper based survey was uh, done uh, with uh, was tar targeted rural communities and particularly those experiencing human infant conflict in Sri Lanka, those who could not access the online service. So I was able to collect information from about 611 respondents and based on their responses, I divided them into six uh, groups as experts, farmers and others who have and have not experienced human infant conflict. So. I, the questions I asked were five pound like type questions, which gave that I gave values between minus two to plus two. There, I, I have the show, I'm showing them they're using bubble graphs. The bubble graphs might look complicated, but don't worry, I'll just tell you what you need to look at in these graphs. Each bubble represents a social group. For example, the dark gray circle represents uh, the uh, experts experiencing human independent country. And uh, the, uh, the light gray circle represents the experts who do not experience, who do, have, do not have personal experience with human infant conflict. And then the black circle indicates farmers experiencing human infant conflict. So the center of the bubble indicates the mean score on the y-axis. So if the bubble uh, is uh, above, the, the center of the bubble is above the zero line, that means they have positive attitudes towards the particular question. And if the center of the bubble is below the zero line, it says that they, they have a negative opinion to uh, that particular question. And the circle size, if, the, if there is a larger bubble, it means that there is low consensus within a group, low agreement within a group. And the smaller circles indicate that there is very high consensus or high agreement within a certain group. So I'll just move on to uh, some of the things that I assess. So I first asked them, uh, about 10 factors, the possibility of 10 factors being causes of human elephant conflict. So, for example, I asked them if habitat loss due to natural causes, habitat encroachment, increasing human population, unplanned development could be causes of human elephant conflict. And uh, out of the 10, all groups had positive scores. So, you can see all the circles above the zero line, um, agreeing that they are all. Uh, causes of human elephant conflict but there was some disparity in opinions uh, for increasing elephant populations being a cause of human elephant conflict so you can see that experts who have experienced human elephant conflict and farmers who have experienced uh, human elephant conflict had uh, thought that increasing elephant population is also a cause of human elephant conflict and this disparity in opinion could be because there are region there are reports of regional expansions of uh, elephant populations and increases in, in uh, populations regionally so this may be uh, uh, due to uh, the elephants not being overcrowding due to not being able to move out from certain areas so this the fact that the causes that where there is low agreement probably should be given more attention and uh, they have to be assessed on case by case basis to see uh, what exactly is the cause uh, in those particular uh, human elephant conflict scenarios because addressing the root causes are essential when mitigating human elephant conflict. So 
Then uh, next I asked people about Levin statements, the agreement on Levin statements, which was related to importance, conservation, and coexistence with uh, elephants. So uh, most of the, uh, most all groups had positive mean scores, that is all groups had the circles above them, zero line, indicating that the uh, uh, sorry, uh, when it comes to uh, in the importance and conservation of elephants. So, for example, when I ask people about elephants, whether elephants be, should be protected, whether they are important for tourism and whether they are important for culture, they had positive means scores, which is very encouraging for elephant conservation. And it is also interesting that all groups agreed that humans have taken over elephant habitats and uh, that they disagreed that elephants have taken over human habitats. But most importantly, what I want to highlight in here is that with the opposing opinions that the farmers who experienced uh, human elephant conflict had regarding that people that because they disagreed that people should try to coexist with elephants and feel that elephants should be removed from uh, human habitats. So this is something that we will need to take into account when communicating or promoting coexistence with people. We need to ensure that their opinions are uh, that we uh, consider their opinions when they, uh, for, for especially of those who are affected by human infant conflict. So moving on to perceptions towards currently available and practiced human infant conflict mitigation methods, I asked about the about the acceptability and effectiveness of twenty five different human infant conflict mitigation tools. So this. These 25 methods was not a comprehensive list, but it was a variety of methods. And I'm not going to be talking to you about each and in individual uh, 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 mitigation tool, but I will just talk to show you some trends that we observed uh, based on the responses we got. So don't get scared by seeing this, uh, uh, this slide. I'll just tell you what you need to see. On the left-hand side, I have all the 25 tools. The bubble graphs are both acceptability and effectiveness. The one, the first and the third graph in the green background shows the acceptability of uh, uh, different social groups towards the human elephant country mitigation tools. And the second and the fourth graph on the left-hand side shows the effectiveness of uh, the mitigation tools people's attitudes towards effect effectiveness. On the right-hand side, we have, uh, I have sorted them according to their accept mean acceptability scores. So on the top, you have those which have received the highest number of, the highest score of ac mean acceptability score. And at the bottom uh, of the table, you have uh, the, the tools that receive the lowest number of, uh, lowest scores for acceptability. And then you can see the tick marks. These tick marks indicate that all groups had positive mean scores and the cross marks indicate that all groups had negative mean scores or that they had negative opinions towards those tools. So what I want to highlight in this, uh, um, in this part uh, is that there were, on, there were only four tools that all groups had positive mean scores for that included electric fencing, and the early warning systems like GPS collars, infrasonic call detectors, and geophones. And uh, most uh, groups uh, then uh, groups had different opinions about the acceptability or effectiveness of most of the other uh, mitigation tools. But I would like to again highlight is uh, are four tools that had uh, opposing opinions between experts and people experiencing human elephant conflict. So when it comes to these four that I've highlighted here, restricting elephants to protected areas, elephant drives, wild elephant holding grounds and translocation, the experts thought that they were both ineffective and unacceptable, while people experiencing human elephant conflict, particularly those farmers, felt that they were, they were accept both acceptable and uh, effective. So the scientific information is available on their ineffectiveness and how they increase the human elephant conflict, which probably needs to be communicated with people uh, who are experiencing them 
to show that uh, that there needs to be better ways to manage human infant conflict. But quite interestingly, everyone agreed, uh, disagreed basically on the acceptability and uh, effectiveness. So basically, everyone thought that there are those those tools that are that could be considered harmful to elephants are both unacceptable and ineffective. For example, killing problem elephants using shotguns or jaw bombs. But unfortunately, even though the majority feels that way, we hear of these events almost on a daily basis. So use of jaw bombs, even though most people um, agree that it is not effective and unacceptable, it happens uh, on a daily basis. So the conclusions I'd like to make uh, based on this study is, is that views of those who experience human elephant conflict should be given special attention when formulating uh, management strategies. And we as researchers should focus uh, our efforts to refining the effectiveness of those tools that are considered uh, acceptable by all stakeholders. And proper communication and awareness among stakeholders about the acceptable and effective uh, tools is important to build consensus between stakeholders and successfully implement them. And uh, so now I would like to take your attention to uh, the National Action Plan uh, that was submitted, formulated by a team of experts uh, led by Dr. Ruthi Rajwanandu in 2020. So this particular action plan is a very comprehensive proposal. It highlights all these drawbacks that I have mentioned uh, in this uh, presentation, and it identifies short come uh, the short, uh, medium, and long term targets with specific time frames and budgets. It in, talks about community involvement and division of responsibility among all organizations and stakeholders involved, and the importance of monitoring and evaluating each and every action that we take to manage human elephant conflict. But uh, unfortunately, to date, this has not been implemented, and we should all be aware of this, the existence of this uh, National Action Plan, and demand the, this, that this uh, action plan be implemented, because this current situation can be, uh, we can have hope that the current situation can be managed with uh, the implementation of this very comprehensive proposal. But uh, now uh, I'd like to bring attention to one of the medium term uh, activities that has been suggested in this uh, uh, action plan, which is looking into novel and innovative approaches to mitigate human infant conflict. And the responsibility of looking into such novel approaches lies in, uh, uh, in, uh, re in researchers and uh, innovators especially. Uh, but we need to make sure that these new methods overcome the or the drawbacks in the methods that we are currently using. So I identify here uh, 12 ideal characteristics that should be there in a human elephant conflict mitigation tool. I'm not going to go there, through them one by one. I'll just highlight a few to see what actually, what, uh, the, what are the ideal characteristics of a human elephant conflict mitigation tool are. So they should be able to prevent human elephant conflict incidents before they occur if possible and should be able to keep elephants away or uh, inside a designated area and then it should not cause death harm uh, death uh, cause death of the animal and should cause minimum harm, harm to the elephant and then um, it should not impede non-targeted species harm or impede non-targeted species it should be able we should be able to modify them easily and altered uh, as required and if possible it should be automated or does not should not require substantial human input and it should be culturally and socially acceptable so as a part of my research i tried to test something which actually if effective uh, it can be implemented effectively on with wild elephants can overcome uh, can accommodate most of these characteristics so these are animal born aversive geofencing devices or satellite link electric shock colors that are currently being used on uh, livestock to manage their movements so these are uh, these were initially developed for dogs for, as anti bark collars or to prevent uh, dogs from going out from home gardens and then they were later tested on wild animals like coyotes wolves 
dingoes uh, and island foxes to mitigate human elephant conflict and has been suggested as a um, as an alternative to uh, lethal control uh, of these wild animals and this was suggested in one of articles uh, of written by Dr. Prithviraj in 2011 published in Loris where uh, this was suggested as a solution to manage problem elephants but it was never uh, was not explored probably for obvious reasons that the technology is not was not available it uh, it is difficult to test it with wild elephants and very due to ethical concerns but if we do not try it we'll probably not know if it works or not but so first to give you an idea of what it is uh, this uh, collars our geofencing devices we can try and connect them to uh, to satellites using GPS technology and program them to deliver an audio warning followed by an electric shock as the elephants reach a virtual boundary. So cattle and sheep have learned, uh, have shown to learn them after few weeks feeding. So elephants being intelligent animals, we can expect them to uh, relay the, the electric shock with the preceding audio warning and even move away, even before receive, learn to move away, even before receiving the electric shock. So this way we can try and train elephants to move away from human dominated landscapes or uh, danger sites like railways and roads. So if the elephants ignore these uh, warn audio warnings and the electric shocks and still proceeds, uh, we can send an, uh, a warning message to people as all, which is all something that all is really being practiced, and ask people to take necessary action to chase away the elephants. But if this actually works and we are able to implement uh, it with wild elephants, it could help uh, prevent a lot of human elephant conflict incidents. But this is not something we can directly test on wild elephants. So I conducted. Uh, trials with captivation elephants to find out first if they would how they would respond to a mild electric shock given on their neck and if they can be trained to modify their movement with an audio warning and avoid receiving an electric shock. So I used a dog training collar, an off-the-shelf dog training collar that could be bought to uh, for this experiment and to uh, to find out if uh, if they can be trained. I first uh, train them to walk along a path uh, to towards a fruit attractant and uh, on on three days basically i trained them to walk along a path so by the end of the three, third day they were all very uh, confident in they were on their own they would walk to the end of the path and feed on the fruits and on the fourth day i conducted my experiments so during these experiments i also uh, tested the uh, they observe their stress-related behaviors and hormone levels to ensure that their welfare is not impacted from being exposed to uh, electric shocks. And I was able to show that the elephant movement can be safely controlled using these collars uh, without uh, lasting effects on their welfare. So I'd like to show you a short video. I hope this will be audible and visible to you. Please let me know if it is not. Uh, this is based on one of the successful trials conducted uh, with an uh, with an elephant at Pinnival Elephant Orphanage. So this manica, this is the fourth day basically. So this elephant is uh, already uh, trained to walk along this uh, path on its own and feed on the fruits. So, but this is the first time it will be receiving the audio warning and the electric shock. I'll walk through it if, in case you don't hear the uh, times I give the audio warning in this video. So that was the first audio warning. Second warning. That's the second audio warning. Shock given. And then the electric shock was given. If it continues to move, then I will repeat the shock. But if it stops, I also stop.
So this was her first trial. I used all female elephants because I had to use elephants that were easy to manage for this experiment. This was the first time something like this was being done. Obviously, this likes it. But in this first trial, she approached the uh, troops. So now it's her second trial on the same day. So that was the first audio warning where she slightly turns and passes. And then she turns uh, as soon as she could. So I assume that because no one complained that all of you saw it and uh, was uh, able to hear me or the video, the warnings received uh, during the video. Yeah, so based on my study, uh, the electric shocks prevented elephants from reaching the food attractant 78% of the time. And 47% of the time, uh, it required only the audio warning to prevent the elephants from proceeding. So this result is quite encouraging. Uh, and it is possible to move on to further development of these collars because uh, what I used was I delivered the audio warning. Sorry, I think I forgot to mention that I delivered the audio warning using a mobile phone attached to the elephant and it was done manually. I gave a ringing tone to give the audio warning. And then uh, when it uh, continued, the electric shock was also given to that dog training collar manually using a remote control. So the next step probably should be developing the software, the right technology, connecting it to the GPS, and ensuring the accuracy of the device and that it delivers the uh, shocks and the warnings at the appropriate places, and further testing it with captive elephants before we can uh, test it on wild elephants. But even before proceeding uh, with such a uh, work, it is important for us to find out what people think about this sort of uh, novel approach because giving an electric shock can sound confronting to people. And we have to ensure that we have enough support and then identify the potential drawbacks, potential challenges that we may face when developing it in the future and implementing that. So as part of my previous uh, survey, I also asked people about Four, four things about uh, the adversary geofencing devices. First, I gave them an illustration explaining uh, what um, it was, uh, what it does. And then at uh, the end of the survey, I asked uh, them the about four questions. First was the possibility for elephants to learn to avoid the electric shock. Second, the acceptability of giving such an uh, electric shock using AGDs to elephants. Third, I asked, the potential effectiveness of AGDs in managing elephant movement and mitigating human elephant conflict. And finally, I asked again about the acceptability if there is enough evidence with pilot studies on captive elephants that this is successful in managing elephant movement. So all groups had positive mean scores, the positive attitudes towards uh, the possibility of elephants uh, to learn and the effectiveness of AGDs in managing elephant movements. But when asked about giving an electric shock using AGDs, experts experiencing human elephant conflict and others, sorry, experts who do not experience human elephant conflict and others who do not uh, experience human elephant conflict had relatively negative answers. They had, they thought it's relatively unacceptable. But when asked again, if it would be acceptable if uh, pilot experiments have been successful, all groups had higher and positive mean scores, which means that if there is evidence, people might find this more acceptable and support it. 
but still there will be a proportion of the population who will feel that it is unacceptable like you can see here we can see the larger circle with the gray light gray circle represented by the experts who are not experiencing human infant country which means there's low agreement within that group regarding this method the acceptability of this method so those who found it unacceptable despite the uh, even with the evidence of uh, uh, even if uh, the evidence of the success of uh, this work with captive elephants are provided, could, could be divided into two groups. One that they are uh, one who thought that this method is unethical or harmful, and the other group who thought that who feel that captive elephant behavior is quite different from wild elephant behavior, and so it will not be successful. So. To, we still do, actually do not know how the wild elephants would respond to this sort of uh, uh, tool. So the only way we can prove it and develop consensus with the second group is that but after doing all the preliminary work with captive elephants, we could try it on one or two dry, uh, wild elephants to see how it works. This should can be done. This will definitely require a lot, a lot of planning and uh, uh, to do but this is the only way we can try and test if it works on wild elephants but for the group who feels that it's unethical and harmful we might need to further assess their opinion to see what they feel if i mean if it is if they feel that it is unethical and harmful despite the success the possible success we need to find out what they feel about it when uh, in situations where there is very high human infant conflict, where there are elephants dying uh, on a daily basis and very high amount of crop raiding, uh, frequency of crop raiding happening. So that is something to be uh, further investigated. But uh, our respondents also provided us with valuable feedback on potential challenges that could be faced uh, during uh, uh, the implementation or development of this process. So this scholar. So first was to uh, making sure that people feel accept this is acceptable and receiving support of uh, from all stakeholders for the implementation of this work, and then ensuring safety and well-being of elephants, which to some some extent that I've all been able to show through my behavioral and uh, hormonal studies that the stress responses are not long lasting. But we need to do further uh, experiments to see how how what long term effects will this have on elephants. Then people also pointed out the logistical difficulties of setting this uh, on putting this on collars because uh, uh, in general, set putting collars on elephants is a very expensive and a risky task. But it is being done. It, uh, collar, collars are being put up on elephants, so this could be part. Uh, this could be done as part of such a such an event but then we have to make sure that the that uh, these devices are durable and have reliable functionality their connectivity they are, they give out the uh, shocks or the warnings at the right place and then there is always the uncertainty of elephants responses how they would respond we, we, each an individual elephant could have different personalities how males and females would respond is another thing that we need to test what i tested was female what, who i tested during my uh, experiment was uh, captive asian elephants and they were all females with mild personalities relatively mild personalities so we still don't know how a male elephant would respond to this but if this we are able to develop this to a certain to a level that it could be tested on wild elephants and be effect and effectively manage their movement this could be a game changer and could help save lives of both humans and elephants so finally what i would like to say is that to promote human elephant coexistence we need reliable management strategies in place to reduce the threats to people's lives and livelihoods and for them to feel that they're safe in order for them to consider the benefits and the importance of sharing the land with elephants. So I hope you all of us can do our part and help both humans and elephants. So that's all for my presentation. I'd like to uh, thank uh, all my supervisors and the funding organizations. My PhD work was funded by 
the, my university and also the National Research Council of Sri Lanka. And I'd also like to thank the Pinnival Elephant Orphanage and all the respondents who participated in my survey for all their support. So thank you very much for everyone for listening and for staying throughout. Thank you, Madam, for that very interesting, informative and comprehensive account on the Asian elephant and human conflict. Um, we were really uh, interested in what you shared, and it was very nice to see those clips of the real life experiments that were conducted. And I'm sure that everyone here has benefited by what you have shared this evening with us. Uh, we are going to open the platform for some questions. Would that be okay from the participants? Does anyone have any questions? You are able to unmute your microphone and you can ask. Also, uh, I'd like to tell, uh, if anybody wants to uh, ask a question in Sinhala, I'm happy to answer in Sinhala as well. Maybe I could ask someone if they all have other uh, experiences with the uh, successful con uh, solutions uh, that they, I wonder if there's anyone who is experiencing human elephant conflict in this audience. Maybe a thumbs up would do. <laughs> Hello, Sarandani. Hi, Dish. How are you? Hi. So I'm not experiencing human elephant conflict, but I rather had a comment that I wanted to share with you. The findings you presented were really interesting about how perceptions differ among different stakeholder groups that you interviewed. And I started to wonder how the perception would change in farmers like uh, towards this kind of experiment. So you kind of like you kind of highlighted how experts responded to it, but I'm wondering uh, how farmers felt about it. Yeah, so uh, what I could say is that in some of the, in, when it comes to uh, coexistence, like I showed in one of the graphs, pe pe farmers experiencing human elephant conflict definitely had a different, op and, and the opposite opinion that people people should not be trying to, it's, it's something difficult to do and that elephants should be removed from conflict areas. Maybe I could go back to that slide for now. Uh, just to, uh, is this the right one? Yeah. So can you see my slide now again? Okay. Yeah, I can see it. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, just give me. So, So there were a uh, few occasions where there were uh, opposing opinions, I would say. So when it comes to, especially when it comes to uh, the opinion on coexisting with elephants and removing elephants, farmers experiencing human elephant conflict disagreed with the rest of the uh, group. And then especially those ones that we uh, as experts highlight are ineffective have been highlighted as uh, uh, methods that are both effective and uh, acceptable. I also like to, because of the time, I didn't want to highlight it, but all groups also agreed that, I wonder if my cursor can be seen, that thunder flashes and firecrackers are quite effective, which is quite interesting to see because uh, this is a daily, uh, this is a method that is being quite often used as a human infant culture mitigation tool. So these were some of the things that I could say that farmers and uh, experts disagreed or uh, disagreed on. Thanks for the question. Thank you, Siren.
Do we have any more questions from the audience? Surendini, I have another question for you. Yes, Nishan. Yeah. So I know it's difficult to like implement these things in a setting like in Sri Lanka, which has a very complicated cultural and also political uh, situation. So I would like to know how you would feel about uh, how, what's your perception on um, impl implementing such a thing? Would it be accepted by, like, do you think it's a, let's say that all the trials come out all right, okay, we get all the good numbers that support the decision. Do you think it will be easy to convince the Sri Lankan community in large towards such an initiative? Actually, I'm very happy that you asked that question, but something that is, uh, for you asked my personal opinion, um, there's two things. One, with the current situation, I personally think it's not something that uh, can be easily uh, developed and uh, implemented in Sri Lanka uh, with people's attitudes as well as the current financial situation. But I have had uh, positive responses from certain people who have asked whether because they actually thought that this has already been developed and that they, we could test it in those their countries. That is quite positive. But in Sri Lanka, I personally feel that further development is going to uh, be very difficult with the financial situation. And also, um, with um, people's attitudes. So there will always be, of course, this sort of thing is with an elephant compared to any other animal. It's something that will be very difficult to implement. So there's a lot more that needs to be done with captive elephants before it can be tried on uh, wild elephants in the first place. And even with captive elephants, um, I had limitations when testing this because the number of elephants that I could use, the we were Obviously, this is the first time we did it, so we were scared actually to see if we would know what to expect. But uh, I took that risk. So the basic work had, or the initial things have been done. So someone can actually take up, take it up, and uh, if funding is available, to start developing it and try and test it. But even with captive elephants, to test it further. I think we don't have that possibility. The present situation, I, with based on my experience, uh, the next step would be probably to test captive elephants, prevent them from moving from one place to another in their uh, free ranging area, right? So here, what I've tested is, I've just trained them to walk along a path, but doing what I want to do next, that is to prevent the elephants from moving, excluding them from a certain side and see if they would, uh, in the long term, if they would learn and even without the electric shock, whether they can be prevented from moving to the other side. It's not something that we can do at the level. I have to be uh, very uh, truthful about it because it is uh, mostly a tourist side, tour tourist attraction, where I can't let the elephants be managed for a research purpose. So I have to adapt to the elephant's routine. So I don't really think that uh, the next step is something that I can uh, do at Pinola unless a dedicated group of elephants, captive elephants, who are free ranging during throughout the day uh, in a, a particular controlled environment can be found. So there are lots of obstacles if this is to be implemented. So this is definitely not something that will be implemented in the near future. The technology has to be uh, developed. 
So there are lots of things that needs to be done. Thank you, Sarain. It's really impressive that you got to test these out in such a complicated setting, and it's really impressive work. I appreciate everything you have done. Thank you. We may have time for maybe one more question. You can also send your questions into the chat box. All right. Uh, if there are no more questions, I would like to once again, on behalf of the Zunet of the Open University of Sri Lanka, thank you, uh, Ms. Surendrani, for sharing with us your knowledge and your expertise. We have learned much from what you have shared with us today, and we are deeply appreciative that you took the time uh, to be here uh, and to share your knowledge with us this evening. So thank you very much. And I'd also like to thank for this opportunity because this is the very first time I conducted such a webinar. So thank you to you all and Dr. Chan Kajasin for inviting me. Thank you very much. And to everyone who is gathered here, have a good evening. And uh, we hope to see you at our next Zunet talk. So keep your eyes open for that. Good night. <laughs>